Major funding for NJTV News is provided in part by the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. And Orsted, committed to the creation of a new long-term, sustainable, clean energy future for New Jersey. This is NJTV News. Anchoring tonight is Brianna Venozzi. Good evening and welcome to NJTV News. I'm Brianna Venozzi. Thank you for joining us. Government leaders are doubling down on the list of states from which travelers will be asked to quarantine. Starting today, visitors to New Jersey, New York, and Connecticut from the following 16 states are under travel advisory and meet the criteria for a 14-day isolation upon arriving to the region. As the rate of new COVID-19 infection surges across the U.S. and the CDC warns the virus is spreading too rapidly for the country to get it under control. Today we updated the list of states from which visitors are being advised to observe a 14-day self-quarantine period. So if you're coming to New Jersey from one of these states, we urge your compliance. And we also urge you to get a COVID-19 test while you are here to ensure your health and safety and that of those around you. The governor says New Jersey's rate of transmission has been slowly ticking upward since we began reopening. The travel advisory is part of his plan to keep it from going higher. The latest figures show 461 new positive tests reported in New Jersey. The cumulative total is more than 171,600, with 47 new COVID-19 related deaths reported overnight. Total confirmed and probable deaths have now reached more than 15,000, but it was the spike in national cases and reports showing out of control crowds at bars and restaurants that caused Murphy to pull a major reversal in the reopening plan, taking this week's restart of indoor dining off the table. He says to get out ahead of the virus, but a senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan reports restaurant owners say it's adding insult to injury. Scheduled deliveries of fresh pineapples, veggies, meat and lobsters arrived as ordered at the Langosta Lounge and eatery on Asbury Park's boardwalk. Workers still prepped and cleaned, but when Governor Murphy hit the pause button on reopening indoor dining Thursday, it left owner Marilyn Schlossback with way too much food and a bad taste in her mouth. I'm just trying to keep my business stable to get through in hopes that we save ourselves. And now to get another blow like that, I mean, I literally cried yesterday when I heard. We have enormous sympathy, but the alternative here is, um, is, is, is worse and, and unacceptable. Murphy says he postponed a reset on indoor dining after seeing too many videos like this one. Crowded venues, mostly at big shore bars like Donovan's Reef, with zero social distancing and few, if any, visible masks. But Jersey diners and restaurants, forced to subsist on meager incomes from just outdoor dining and takeout business, felt wrongly targeted. I don't punish both of my kids when one of them does something wrong. <laughs> like, why aren't the players who are breaking the rules, getting the, the impact of this. We have a problem of enforcement. If we have establishments that aren't following rules that are very clearly written out, then we need to enforce those people to get in line. You got you know, ABC and um, you got the police, so those are the people who should be enforcing the law. Uh, I, I, you know, I certainly don't support the behavior because it's gonna ruin it and it did ruin it for everybody. It's crushing, it's outrageous. Senator Declan O'Scanlan's also critical of the governor's action. He says, don't slam the restaurants and give the overcrowded bars a chance to get it right. I'd rather do that than pull someone's license and destroy uh, the jobs of all the people that work there. I was in touch with some of the bar owners who were in some of those videos. And, you know, they get it. They get that they screwed up. I, but do they know they screwed up for everybody else? That, that's exactly what we need to avoid. 
The governor's order also hit the casino industry. Borgata says it won't reopen on Thursday now. Casinos that do can't serve food or drinks. The restaurant lobby predicted one in five establishments could close because of the pandemic, and now this. It means workers rehired could get laid off again. Bartender Mike Mixon's lost 50 to 70 percent of his daily income. For me, it's tough as well. Just working as many shifts as I can to make up for the money that is not coming in. And with thousands of dollars of food ordered ahead of Thursday. That food is going to either go to waste or it's going to be donated, and they have no way of making that money back. So if they were on the edge, now you've just put the other nail in the coffin. I don't know. This kind of stuff is just wearing me down. It's wearing us all down. We're fighting so hard. Restaurants can still offer outdoor dining, but Langosta lost six grand last Friday when it rained and they had to shut down. This regulatory rain out on indoor dining could last indefinitely. In Asbury Park, I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJTV News. And the state is still facing ongoing criticism over the response to the spread of COVID-19 inside long-term care facilities. But it turns out complaints over insufficient staffing, a lack of resources and inadequate care were a problem long before coronavirus complaints began piling up. That backlog is raising questions about New Jersey's ability to inspect nursing homes moving forward. NJ Spotlight healthcare writer Lilo Stainton joins me with the latest in her reporting. Lilo, what exactly were in the complaints and how long ago were these filed? Hi, Bray. Yeah, well, we didn't get to see the actual complaint, but I can say they, they range from a whole number of things. Um, some of them date back two years uh, or as much as two years, which sounds alarming. Um, but I think it's important to keep in mind if, they're, if it's considered an immediate jeopardy or an IJ complaint, it was resolved or addressed within not necessarily resolved, but addressed within at least uh, two days, 48 hours. So what, what these backlog of 4,000 complaints and 700, which were marked more important than the others, um, they're likely to be smaller level things, lower level things, like a window latch maybe, or cold food that someone reported a year and a half ago. So it's not that they're not important, but it's important to keep in context. This is a whole broad array of concerns. I guess what I'm hearing then is that um, they were really up against it before a public health crisis broke out. What did the Department of Health say about this? Exactly. Well, you're absolutely right. Um, one advocate said this is, an, a, this is an industry that struggles with these issues on a good day. So when you have COVID, uh, it's even worse. The Department of Health um, conceded exactly what they had said in the Manette report, which was that um, essentially a lack of inspectors, a lack of surveyors. Um, the Department of Health said this is the case. They, they said we've lost staff over the last two administrations, um, particularly starting in 2008, which was under former Governor Christie. Um, you know, the Department lost a lot of people and other resources. So we have now 16 surveyors to do these complaints, 57 of which are working on other, additional 57 that are working on uh, annual complaints, but it's not a huge staff to do what they need to, to, to address these concerns. I mean, is it something that there is some confidence in being able to address and inspect, or is the legislature going to have to intervene here? Yeah, the legislature is looking. Their uh, Assemblywoman Veneri Huddle and Senator Joe Vitale are apparently putting in bills that will address some of the issues in the report. So stay tuned. We will let you know. And we will check back with you. All right, Lilo, thanks so much. Thank you. For more of Lilo's in-depth reporting, sign up for the NJ Spotlight newsletter. There's also now an evening edition. Just head to njspotlight.com and click on newsletters. Immigrant workers and their families also say they've been left behind during the pandemic, claiming the health and economic impact of COVID-19 was made worse by the lack of relief aid reaching immigrant communities throughout the state. Now they're calling on the governor and legislature to throw a lifeline. Michael Hill reports. 
thousands of New Jersey's immigrant workers did not get a penny from the Federal CARES Act, those stimulus checks of $1,200 a person. That includes Rigoberto Mejia. He's documented, but filing taxes jointly with his undocumented wife disqualified them and their two U.S. citizen children from getting federal stimulus money. Not only has the pandemic kept both parents out of work, but all four family members caught the coronavirus as well. They've since recovered. The family's struggling, but getting by thanks to the charity of Wind of the Spirit and others and Rigoberto's $600 a week unemployment insurance checks. They want more and say they've earned it. Rigoberto spoke through a translator. We are human beings just like everyone else, and we are suffering the same medical issues that everyone else is suffering, except we also have not received any kind of help from a system that we've justly been paying into. So what we want from the state of New Jersey is a full and complete um, um, help for our community. Senator Teresa Ruiz introduced a bill in mid-May to give one-time $1,000 payments to undocumented workers, in all $35 million. The bill is not the what I would love to see done, but it is a start. And when the pandemic hit, everybody acted like our undocumented families did not exist. New Jersey Policy Perspective says undocumented workers have contributed more than a billion dollars over 10 years to the state's unemployment fund. Immigrant advocates say that should count for something. The state and localities are all trying to figure out, counties are trying to figure out how to balance their budgets, but the way that we see this is that we will not recover fully as a state unless we include everyone who works in the state, who contributes to our communities. I think it's an outrageous proposal. Republican Senator Mike Doherty opposes the bill as the state ponders drastic budget cuts. Here's a governor who's saying he's going to borrow $14 billion, $14 billion to cover budget gaps, and he's proposing to hand out $35 million to uh, undocumented workers, people that are in New Jersey illegally. Senator Ruiz says her bill has 15 co-sponsors and she's looking for more to help a population that represents nearly 8% of New Jersey's workforce. Michael Hill, NJTV News. Meantime, immigrants detained at the Elizabeth Detention Center say they've been facing a twin threat, the spread of COVID-19 inside congregate living situations and an incarceration system they say targets immigrants of color. Advocates filed a class action lawsuit in May calling for all 100 detainees to be released from the Elizabeth site, which is privately operated through a contract with ICE. So far, at least 18 detainees have tested positive and one guard has died from the coronavirus. One plaintiff, though, Hector Mendoza, was deported to Mexico in May just days after the suit was filed, and his family hasn't heard from him since. Immigrants and their supporters say little was done to protect them from the coronavirus. They were not allowed to wear masks, and I think after about a month, if not more, they came in and they gave us masks. We were not wearing it inside where we were staying, but when we were called to medical, that's when we have to put on masks. And what is um, social distance? It's impossible. We were on top of each other. That's in detention center, it's impossible. No, we're sleeping on top of each other. We sit on one bed. We sit on one table, we shower together. It's impossible. In a response, the center's operator, CoreCivic, says they've, quote, rigorously followed guidance from local and federal health authorities, have encouraged social distancing and mask wearing consistent with all CDC recommendations. The state's 78,000 medical marijuana patients will now be able to reduce their risk and exposure to COVID-19. The state is allowing cannabis products to be delivered directly to their homes, avoiding lines and pickup at New Jersey's dispensaries. It's part of the Jake Honig law Governor Murphy signed last summer expanding the medical marijuana program, but the home delivery service never took off. And as Leah Mishkin reports, launching it comes with complications. I have a lot of pain in my extremities, tingling, itching, burning, throbbing. Chris Barris was born with a genetic mutation called KIF1A, causing a form of paraplegia. The 29-year-old says there were times where he couldn't get out of bed for weeks, but relief came when he started taking medical marijuana. It really helped my anxiety and my pain levels. 
When the coronavirus pandemic hit New Jersey, there were added concerns for the more than 78,000 medical marijuana patients already immune compromised. Barris captured this video in March showing a line of cars as he waited for hours to get in a dispensary. Through the coronavirus, uh, when, we, when we had a lot of restrictions, um, there's long lines and, and everything else. So the state of New Jersey put forward their, their rules and regulations to allow for the current ATCs to um, provide a plan for home delivery. Scott Rutter, president of New Jersey Cannabis Association, says this new waiver signed by the State Department of Health allowing the 11 permitted dispensaries to start home delivery is a game changer. We're eager to launch. Harmony Dispensary and Secaucus is ready to go. Each vehicle will have to be equipped with a GPS tracking system and all the security measures. So we'll have a combination of security um, as well as dispensary employees conducting the deliveries uh, to make sure it's done safely and that the medicine reaches the patient. What do you say to people who might be against this because of safety concerns? It will be in a safe, unmarked vehicle. Uh, the people who will be delivering will have a background checks. I don't see that being a big issue whatsoever. We don't see crime at local dispensaries. We're not going to see crime associated with home delivery. Um, it's just not an issue you see in any other state. Barris says it's critical because accessibility has always been a struggle for patients like him. Getting up on a certain time and getting there hopefully before they stop serving people, having to have my grandmother drive me and spend her gas money, it, it would just make me feel a lot better as well to not have to impose upon others for transportation. You know, if you've ever been to a, a dispensary, um, the folks there are, you know, people who have significant issues, right? So they have, they're in wheelchairs, they're in walkers, uh, they have seizure disorders, like I said. Um, some of these patients are, are, are children. When you found out that this was actually happening, what was your reaction? My girlfriend was sitting there watching me as I paused the video and started clapping, like, yes, yes. A major victory, Barris says, long overdue. For NJTV News, I'm Leah Mishkin. Well, two former political rivals have struck a deal that'll save taxpayers and teachers millions of dollars a year. Rhonda Schaffler has details on a health care overhaul bill heading to Governor Murphy's desk, plus the day's top business stories. Rhonda. Rihanna, New Jersey's teachers and school employees will pay less for their health care coverage now that a health care overhaul bill has won final legislative approval and has won the support of Governor Murphy. Proponents say the legislation will save hundreds of millions of dollars, which will benefit state taxpayers. The legislation was the result of a deal reached back in March between Senate President Steve Sweeney and the New Jersey Education Association. Meantime, Governor Murphy says a furlough agreement reached with the CWA could save the state $100 million. Tens of thousands of public workers will have furloughs averaging 10 days through July. They'll also have some pay raises delayed. The CWA says the agreement will save thousands of jobs as it calls for no layoffs. State government offices will have to cut expenses now that the new state budget has been signed into law by Governor Murphy. At his daily briefing, the governor outlined some of the cuts included in that budget. It cuts non-salary operating expenses by 5% across the board. And while state aid to our schools and other critical payments are maintained, vital social programs that are helping residents through this pandemic are safeguarded and a modernization of our unemployment platforms is seeded. This plan cuts all other discretionary grants by 10%. The governor anticipates the state will end the current fiscal year with a surplus of more than $950 million, but he says that's not enough of a cushion, and he renewed his call for more federal assistance. Small businesses have until midnight tonight to apply for PPP loans from the Small Business Administration. The application window closes after that. Meantime, the EDA has extended its window to accept applications for the Small Business Emergency Assistance Grant Program. The new application deadline is July 8th. Turning out of Wall Street, here's a look at the trading day. I'm Rhonda Schaffler, and those are your top business stories.
Support for the Business Report is provided by the New Jersey Society of CPAs, equipping and empowering New Jersey's accounting and finance professionals to thrive in their careers. Learn more at njcpa.org. With the July 7th primary exactly one week from today, most voters will be casting a vote by mail this year not machine. But a new report from the left-leaning think tank New Jersey Policy Perspective claims the state's ballot design favors candidates who are party favorites, while putting the names of lesser-known opponents in columns in areas that are harder for voters to spot. What's worse, according to the report, New Jersey is the only state that organizes the ballot around party-backed candidates, alleging it gives them an overwhelming advantage letting party insiders pick the winners not the voters. Several proposals to reformat state ballots have been floated, but it's unclear if the legislature will act. And for more on the report and the history behind New Jersey's ballot design, check out Colleen O'Day's story on njspotlight.com. We're continuing our NJ Decides 2020 coverage by introducing you to the candidates, partnering with NJ Spotlight to be your home for New Jersey politics. We've started with the hotly contested District 2 race in South Jersey, where political scientist Bridget Harrison, mental health advocate Amy Kennedy, and lawyer Will Cunningham are all vying to take on incumbent Congressman Jeff Van Drew in November. All three going on the record with chief political correspondent Michael Aaron. Tonight, we meet Amy Kennedy. Amy Kennedy, thank you for being with us. How is this race looking at the moment with 10 days to go? Oh, thank you. It's good to be with you. Uh, feeling energized, feeling like we are getting close to the finish line. It's been uh, different, obviously, with vote by mail because uh, the people in this district have been voting for weeks already. And so we know a lot of those ballots are already in, but there's still many more to come in in the last 10 days. So it's exciting. Bridget Harrison has been around New Jersey politics for at least 20 years. How formidable an opponent is she? You know, I think people are really interested in seeing something different right now, uh, something that is more of a, a grassroots support because we want to know that the voices in South Jersey are heard. And I think that I'm the person to do that. I'm raising my family here. For me, this isn't just a house, it's my home. And my whole family lives in the area. And I think that's why I've been able to get a lot of that support because I understand what's happening in our communities. You say you're part of a grassroots movement uh, Bridget Harrison says you have corporate contributors, uh, one in particular that gets under your skin when she points up WellPath, a company that runs private nonprofit prisons uh, and that your husband serves on the board of and that has given you $11,000. What's your point of view on this? Yeah, I think that's exactly what's misleading about this because I'm not taking corporate money. Uh, so she wants to present to voters uh, that I'm taking this money from a corporation when in fact it's individual donors and I have over 5,000 individual donors that have given less than $100 each and that's why I say it's really a, a grassroots support that I have and so to attack the mental health work we're doing uh, really feels like she's trying to misrepresent our efforts and our work is well past a mental health company. You know, Patrick's work is always focused on mental health because that's where he is an expert and that is his lived experience. And so while we don't agree with ICE detention centers and for-profit prisons, I do believe that we always need to make sure we are helping people who are experiencing trauma. And that's going to be where I focus my efforts in Congress, knowing that there'll be a lot of students going back to school in September, or, or possibly not, that are going to need help with that transition. And that when we can provide that kind of help to our young people, it'll be a lifeline for their families as well. You say she's part of the Democratic South Jersey machine. Uh, if you're successful in the primary, aren't you gonna need that machine in order to beat Jeff Van Drew in the fall? I think that to beat Jeff Van Drew in the fall, we really need to have a vision of what we want this country to look like going forward. And for me, that means focusing on social justice. I think that we know 
moving out of the coronavirus and George Floyd's death, that it will be really important to focus on the values of our community. And that's where I'll be able to galvanize support and get people excited about a change for our area. We know that the economy will be an important focus as well as unemployment's on the rise. And those are the things voters care about. All right, Amy Kennedy, thank you for being with us. Thank you, Michael. Good to see you. You can find Michael and Colleen's reporting on our new NJ Spotlight, NJ TV News Politics page with stories on the contest, candidates' profiles, as well as useful information to help you, the voter, check your registration, district details, and voting options. So go and head to njspotlight.com and check it out. And that's our broadcast tonight, but head over to njtvnews.org and njspotlight.com where we'll continue to keep you updated on all the news impacting the Garden State. I'm Brianna Venosi for the entire team. Thanks for being here. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years. PSENG, we make things work for communities. And Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. I've got cancer. I've got cancer treatments you won't find anywhere else. I've got cancer researchers closing in on a cure. I've got cancer, but I've also got a nurse navigator who's there every step of the way. I've got cancer and I'm fighting it. We're fighting it at New Jersey's only NCI-designated Comprehensive Cancer Center. If cancer comes into your life, you'll find the most comprehensive care at RWJ Barnabas Health and Rutgers Cancer Institute of New Jersey. Have some water. Look at these kids. How are you? What do you see? I see myself. I became an ESL teacher to give my students what I wanted when I came to this country. The opportunity to learn, to dream, to achieve, a chance to belong and to be an American. My name is Julia Toriani Crompton and I'm proud to be an NJEA member.